Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I think it's loud enough. Can you all hear me? Okay, that's a good thing. Uh, welcome to worship. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tom Lyons. I'm the Minister of Music here at Community Presbyterian Church. And whether this is your first Sunday with us, you are in virtual, you're here virtually or with us here in the sanctuary, or uh, you're joining us after a long time away, worship this morning is special because you are here. A quick note to those of, uh, who are watching in Facebook land, uh, please leave a comment in the chat to let us know you're watching. It helps us keep track of who's, uh, who's here and who's not. Uh, for those of you who are here in the sanctuary, I would be remiss if I didn't remind you to please sign the attendance pads. The folks in the office get very picky when they look at the, and see that they don't see that your name is on there and that way we can mark you here accordingly. Um, we have a few announcements this morning. First, we welcome Reverend Donna Bowen with us this morning, who will be sharing God's word and sermon. Thank you, Donna. It's good to have you here with us. Um, Robert and Melissa uh, are with those families and church members uh, who went to our yearly church retreat down at Montgomery. We pray for them and that they had a great weekend and that they have a safe trip home back to Atlantic Beach later this afternoon. The office will be closed tomorrow. I hate to tell you, but if you try and call, nobody will answer the phone. If you stop by, nobody will be here to open the door. We look forward to seeing you on Tuesday when the office reopens at 9 a.m. VBS is coming and the food truck party will be rolling in here at the church on, uh, from June 20th through the 24th. In your bulletins, you'll find uh, a blue insert with a list of items that Melissa has so kindly asked that if you can help support her in the missions of VBS, she would be grateful. And at that same time, on the yellow sheet, it is, uh, they are still looking for volunteers uh, to help. I think the Stalters might be a great uh, if you're in town, would be great to, to help out with that. Uh, if not, you can watch me on, online. Um, there is still time to sign up. I missed it. Uh, there's still time to sign up to, uh, your grandchildren or your children uh, for that online, and uh, they will have an amazing week nonetheless. Uh, we continue to collect for our Blue Bin Mission of the Month, which is BEAM. Thank you for your continued support of all the missions of the church. And as we enter this holy time of worship, I invite you to stand with us this morning for our call to worship printed in the bulletin, followed by hymn number 354, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. I invite you to stand if you are able. We gather, to get to, we gather today because we are called to worship together. We are here where God wants, wants us to be. No matter where we go, no matter what we endure, God, God is using us in kingdom building ways. Even if we feel trapped or lost, a way has been made for us to find another path or to bloom where we have been planted. Let, Let us worship, worship God. God. I invite you to open your hymnals to number 354, leaning on the everlasting arms as we lift our voices in song this morning.
be seated. Let us continue this morning as we pray a, a prayer of confession and hear these words of assurance. We gather on a somber holiday. We remember with sadness those we have lost. Let us not glorify the conflicts and violence ones from us. Let us rather give glory to God who calls peaceably our nations and peoples. May our worship of God unite rather than divine. And hear these words of assurance. The Christ who bore his own body, the sin of the world, offers us not judgment, but mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. As we continue this morning, it's so nice to see faces here who have, be, have joined us to be part of this morning's worship. And if we might stand and offer Christ's peace to each other, recognizing that Christ is here in the room with us and that as we gather together, God's spirit flows from one to the other and we are all enriched by the presence that is here in this worship this morning. If we might rise and offer signs of peace. be seated. Good morning, friends, again. Um, time for all ages. Lighters. They're lovely. They light things like the candles. They let us to see things, but as you can see, they light. What happens when we put one in water? What happens when we allow the stresses of life to creep in? What, allows, what happens when we're the one who's in the darkness? What happens? when that crushing forces from inside bear us down. So often, we don't see the struggles that the people that we interact with go through. And so it's so easy to judge when somebody is down. What happens when that person is down, they're light? is extinguished. Sometimes it's our responsibility to come along and be that light in somebody else's world when we're down. Be the light of change, friends. Be the light of change. this time, I invite the ushers to come forward for uh, this morning's offertory. And friends, it's always worth repeating, all the missions at this church are always grateful for anything that you can give. 
and we're grateful for the time, the money, and the effort that you put forth to, um, to further God's kingdom. I invite you to listen to the words <coughs> of our offertory this morning through a new light. Um, it is entitled, If We Just Talk of Thoughts and Prayers. Please be seated. Technology. It never works when you need it to. <laughs> the first reading this morning comes from the book of Revelations, verse, uh, chapter 22, verses 12 through 14, 16 and 17, and 20 through 21. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes 
that they may have their right to be the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city outside of the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the adulterers, and everyone who love, uh, loves and practices falsehoods. Jesus, have sent my angel to you uh, to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say come, and let the one who hears say come, let the one who is thirsty come, and let one who wishes take the free, free gift of water of life. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The, Lord, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Here ends the first reading. Good morning. For our second reading, we're going to continue to look at the book of Acts. Um, we have been reading from Luke's account of the early church and listening to discover the many levels of teaching and meaning that Luke has as he writes this book. He was a master storyteller and he was also someone deeply in love with Christ and with God, and through his stories, helps us to understand what this revelation of God means as an early church begins to form and begins to live in the world and to make a difference in the world through their acts of love. Paul has gone with his friend Silas and they have been traveling along the coast of Greece and have now come to the top of the Aegean Sea uh, where Paul has received a call from God asking him to go to Macedonia, which was a very foreign place in that point in time in history. Um, it was a place where there were very few Jewish people there were very few people who would have called themselves God-fearers. That he was really going into an area in which he would find very little support, very little encouragement, very little safety, as he and Silas loudly, proudly, passionately witnessed to Jesus the Christ. So at, they have traveled now to Macedonia, and one of the cities in Macedonia is Philippi. It was founded probably 300 or so years before Paul and Silas, so it's been there for a while. It's not a really large town, but it's in an important location. It's on one of the major roads that flowed east to west, west to east, bringing goods and things for as far away as Spain and Italy, all the way to Syria and Turkey and, and back and forth. So there were lots and lots of travelers on the road who spent the t some time, perhaps a night, perhaps a week, um, in Philippi as they traveled back and forth. Also, just outside the city in some of the hills there, there had uh, they found some gold, and there were some gold mines. So the people who lived in Philippi had some wealth. They earned wealth from being um, innkeepers and people helping those who were traveling east and west. And they earned some money collecting this gold and creating products and jewelry and things out of this gold. But as you can probably imagine, they're a very diverse group. I mean, there are people from all over the known world, and they are doing all kinds of things to earn money, and they are worshiping all kinds of gods that they have brought with them that are part of their family tradition. So it is kind of a wild and crazy place. And yet Paul and Silas, listening to God's call, have come there, and they have met first a woman, Lydia, 
who is one of the rare God-fearers uh, along a creek, and have talked to her, and she has um, accepted the words that Paul and Silas, and they have begun just a small, tiny little group, just a small little church family, a small group of people who called the, themselves the people of the way, and they were meeting and trying to figure out what it meant to live as people who were in love with Christ in a very, very foreign and kind of crazy place. And so our story begins, continues today, where we are going to be introduced to two more people who are living in this little town of Philippi. And as I said, Luke is a great storyteller. I mean, he tells you enough details so that you can put yourself in the place and you can picture the people and you can see the action and you are just drawn into the stories that he's telling you. And on another level, because he was so in love with God and he was so concerned that these early, tiny, little home churches um, would flourish, would thrive, in the stories on a, on a little bit lower level, a little bit deeper level, he begins to introduce the foundational core things that make up discipleship. If one is going to call themselves a follower of Christ, if one is going to call themselves a child of God, a member of God's kingdom, someone who loves Christ in the world and is really willing to witness in the world through acts of love and kindness and generosity, there are some things we need to know about how God works in the lives of people. And so very quietly, he introduces these different concepts. And today he begins to uh, reveal and put some words to define both the word salvation and the word conversion. Now these we are, you know, if you've grown up in the church, these are churchy words. I mean, you know, you don't hear them, they're churchy words. And over 2,000 years, their definition has been interpreted sometimes accurately because people have read the gospel and looked at the words that were spoken and try and have listened through the eyes of God, love and god and have understood what they mean and other times not so much sometimes people have looked at that and they have shrunk down the meaning they have put boundaries around the meaning because they would like conversion and salvation, not to be so wide, not to be so generous, not to be for everybody at all times and all, we like to like kind of bring it down so we have a little bit of control over it. So today as I'm reading these two stories, I want you to be, you know, please fall in love with the stories and, and connect with the characters in the stories, but also maybe just a little bit be listening to what Luke has to say about salvation and conversion. So I'm going to go ahead and read this two-part story and then we'll go back and look at it a little bit. As I said, Paul has been in Philippi. He continues to be in Philippi. He is wandering around the marketplace. He's walking around the central plaza and he is talking to anybody who will listen to him. He says, one day we were going to a place of prayer. We met a female slave who had a spirit of divin divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit within her, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very hour. But when the, her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought these before the magistrates, they said, these men, these Jews are disturbing our city. They are advocating customs that are not lawful for us 
being Romans to adapt or observe. <clears throat> Shortcut, they, they're taking away our livelihood. The crowd joined in attacking and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them severe flogging, they threw them in prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, the jailer put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. <clears throat> Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. <clears throat> they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. <clears throat> Excuse me. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. <coughs> Two stories, two stories about folks who were enslaved, who owed their lives to someone else. First, we have this woman, and she has the spirit that resides within her that allows her to be a good fortune teller. And her handlers, these two men, these handlers, have decided this is how they're going to make money. So they drag her out and they set her on a, on a corner and people come by and she you know, tells them what their future is going to be and they're earning a lot of money. It is a really good deal for them. They don't have to work, they don't have to do anything, they just drag this young woman around and, and their finances are secure. Paul and Silas come and something happens. The spirit within her somehow recognizes who these two people are, and the spirit begins to shout, you know, that these are, are people from God, and what they are talking about offers a kind of salvation that they have not heard before, about before. The problem is, is as this woman, who is being led by the spirit within her, is wandering around the city for a day, two days, three days, shouting to anyone in the area that, that Paul and Silas are these missionaries, these witnesses to the work of God, she's not earning any money. You know, I mean, I, you can just see her handlers are probably just absolutely frustrated because here's their livelihood and now for two, three days, no money. No, there, no money at all is coming in. Now, in the story, Luke says that Paul was annoyed. And I thought to myself, that doesn't make sense. You know, what we've learned about Paul is that he is a kind and he's a generous and he is looking for ways for people to live in wholeness. Being annoyed just didn't make sense at all. So I got in contact with a friend who is a biblical scholar. Actually, she's a Greek scholar. I mean, she speaks Greek more often than she speaks English. And I said, I have a chore for you. These are the two Greek words that are being translated as annoyed. Does that make sense? So she, you know, did her little rabbit hunt and went down all the holes and she comes back and she goes, no, that's a terrible translation. The first word means troubled. The second little word that's next to it means greatly. So Paul was not annoyed at this woman who was following, announcing who he was. He was greatly troubled for this woman because 
her life was in danger. She was not earning any money. She was following Paul and Silas and not earning any money. And Paul knew if she continued to do that, she could be killed. Because women weren't worth very much anyway. But this one wasn't even earning her keep. So Paul says to her, the spirit needs to leave. The spirit needs to leave because this woman does not need to be in danger. She needs to be saved from being in danger. She needs to be saved by, from being manipulated by these handlers. This woman deserves more. And so she is um, given the opportunity for new beginnings, new ways of living. But that doesn't, that doesn't um, sound so good to her handlers. Her handlers are saying, whoa, we, we have no money making here. You know, what do we, I mean, am I going to have to get a job? Am I going to have to work for a living? What is going on here? And so they grab Paul and Silas and they run into the center of the plaza where the magistrate's table is and they bring them up and they, they have this great, you know, I mean, they're, they're saying these horrible things. They're making me do things that are not appropriate for being a Roman. What they really mean is, we used to be making money off this woman, and now we're not. And these guys, it's their fault. So, you know, the Paul and Silas are arrested. They're beaten. They're thrown in the uh, prison there, and not in the cells that are close to the door, but way in the back, way in the back, a stone building, way in the back. And not only are they put in a cell with a door that's locked, inside the cell, their legs are chained to the floor. They are in that cell. They are going nowhere. <clears throat> the town of Philippi, I told you, was kind of at a central, good location, roads and things. It also happened to have been built right over a fault line a really serious fault line. And the problem with Philippi was that on a regular basis, it had earthquakes. As a matter of fact, about 600 years after this story, there was such a major earthquake that the entire city ceased to be. So they are in the cell, and there is an earthquake. Now, you would think if you were in a, a prison cell and there was an earthquake and the building kind of collapsed around you and the doors popped open, I'd be out of there in a shot, you know? I mean, I would be out of there. I would be gone. I, I'd be in the next town before they realized I was gone. And that's what the jailer thought. The jailer was a, a low-level person who was, you know, hired by the Roman authorities to make sure the people didn't leave. And the deal with his job was, if you lost a prisoner, if someone escaped and wasn't there, your, your life was over. You were going to be killed. And th that, was, that was the job description. Keep these people in their cells or you're dead. That's it. So he is ready. The jailer, when he sees that the, the building is falling down and the doors no longer function, he, and he's just sure that everyone has left, and he's getting ready to take his own sword and kill himself rather than wait around for somebody else to do it. But again, Paul, and you, you see this theme of acts of love and generosity. You know, he, he looked after the woman. He helped her get away from being manipulated by these men. He made sure that she wasn't killed because she wasn't doing her job. Acts of love. And now an act of love, he says, hey, we didn't escape. We're still here. I, I, can you imagine the jailer? I mean, he ready with the sword, ready to kill himself. And the guy in the back of, way back of the jail says, we're still here. He goes in, he sees that they're there, and he just falls at his knees, and he says, what can I do to be saved? Now, that's not a theological question at that point in time. This is, they're going to kill me. What do I need to do to make sure they do not kill me today? How do I be saved from that? And Paul says, believe in God. 
Believe in God that God's going to find a way. That your life no longer needs to be a life where you are in a job where if you happen to fail, your life is over. Jailer comes out and takes these people out. And, and you notice, Paul and Silas love this jailer. They stay there. They prevent him from being killed. They, talk, they show him a way of commitment and faithfulness to a God that allows them to remain even though their life is in danger. And one of the first things the jailer does in response to that overwhelming act of love is to go and get water and cloths and clean the wounds from the beating that they have taken. Luke's kind of giving us something there. You know, acts of love lead to more acts to love, lead to more acts of love. And God's love goes from one to the next, to the next, to the next. So in, these, in this two-part story, Luke talks about salvation as an act of love in which an individual who is feeling enslaved, who is feeling pressured, who's feeling dead, is given new life through God's grace, through a moment in time is, is incorporated into God's overwhelming pool of love and rest there. And the stories also begin to introduce what a conversion lifetime looks like. For Luke, and for, for many of us, conversion is not a one-time, I wake up, I'm zapped, I fall off a horse, I'm blind. It's not that kind of thing at all. It's much more subtle. It's much more intimate. It's much quieter. It is a sense that St. Augustine said, there was an emptiness in me. There was a hole in who I was as a person. I was not fully me until I recognized that God's spirit dwelled in me and filled up that empty hole and made, and made for me a life in which I could be fully alive and thrive. And conversion is kind of like that. It's a lifelong, imperfect journey in which there is an intersection of life events and holy moments in which we fall deeper and deeper in love with God, in which acts of love flow out of us over and over and over again. And in a perfect world, we fall so deeply in love with God that there is no line between what is us and what is Christ's spirit dwelling within us. So Luke is beginning, just beginning, just in a few short words, just two short little stories, beginning to talk about salvation from life events and salvation from the emptiness inside us. And he's beginning to talk about a life of discipleship, which is a life of conversion, falling deeper and deeper in love with God. When I look at this, these two brief stories, I think the takeaway for me, the takeaway for me is I try to listen to what Luke is telling us about how wide and how deep and how generous God's love is, is that acts of love. There's the act of love of God loving us, even though we are quite imperfect and broken people. That's the first act of love. And that act of love continues to walk with us throughout our life, even though we still stumble and we still end up in hurtful places. The second thing is because God has loved us so much that God was willing to give God's own life for us, that the act of love that dwells and spills out leads us like the jailer to look around and say, how can I express God's love by helping you, by sharing God's love through feeding, through washing, through listening, to holding, to caring, to lifting up 
when people are hurting and broken. I think that's the, the beginning of the story of Acts. That's the beginning of the story of the early church and what is foundational, what it is that we take with us and continue to live in our lives today. We have been loved and we are called to love as wide and fully and abundant as we can. Let us pray. Dear Lord, this morning as we gather, may we hear and feel your presence. May the empty spaces in us be filled with your spirit, with your love, with your goodness and kindness. And may we be so entrenched, so filled, so covered and soaked in that love that we see others and we want to respond in acts of love so they also might know freedom and new life and new beginning. We pray in your name. Amen. And if we might rise as you are able, we're going to sing 284. They'll know we are Christians by our love. We continue this morning in prayer. A time in our worship time together as we rest in God's arms and we pray from our deepest places within us for those near and those around the world. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, on this Memorial Day, when we remember those who have sacrificed all so that we might be free and safe and in warm, comfortable places, we pray for our world. We see in papers and on video and television that our world is broken this weekend, that there are people struggling in Ukraine and others simply to be allowed to remain to live free 
and in, in charge of the things that are important to them, in charge of growing healthy children and good communities. We pray for all the places in the world that are struggling. And dear Lord, as we look at our country, we, look, we pray for the people in Uvalde in Texas whose lives will never be the same. We pray for an end to violence and hate and division. We pray that we might come together over love over kindness and generosity and respecting the lives of each other. And in this community in which we reside, in this Beaches community, we pray for all those today who are struggling, who are looking for home, for food, for shelter, we pray for those who are looking for meaningful jobs, a way to support their families, who are looking for someone to reach out with acts of love so that they may also know that they are valuable and loved persons of God. And today we pray for this church family we pray for those who are on retreat. We hope that the weather and the games and the fun and the fellowship have drawn them closer to each other and closer to you, and that they might return to us with a deeper sense of what it means to be your disciple. And within our community, we thank all of those who have been part of military service who have sacrificed so much. We pray for the families whose loved ones did not come home. We pray for people in our midst who are still celebrate, still dealing with disabilities and night terrors and pain. We pray that we will always be gracious and kind and say thank you for the service and the dedication and the sacrifices that they have made and for those who are making those even today as we gather. And within our community, we, have, we ask for prayers for some particular families, for Larry W., for Judy C., and for the Bragan family. And we leave some time this morning to share the thoughts and prayers that are most upon our hearts. Dear Lord, we are your people. We are your community who have gathered to worship you and to hear your call upon our lives. And today, may we pray a prayer that your faithful church has said for many, many years. May we join with the saints who go before and lift our voices to those who live today and pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Celebrate with hot dogs and 
barbecue and fellowship and friends and are so grateful that we might be person to person with people again this year as we gather. Let us remember that we are loved. We are so deeply and abundantly loved and that it is nothing for us to go ahead and share that love through acts of love with the people that we bump into this week. May we be those shining lights and go out and talk about good news and hope and possibility and new beginnings. We pray these things in your glorious name. Amen. <laughs>